Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're going to get started shortly. We're just going to give another minute or so to let folks enter the webinar. Okay, I think we've got a critical mass. I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. I'm Karen Morell of Higher Heights Consulting. I'm working, I'm a consultant working with Aspen Institute Community Strategies Group. And today I'm also gonna be serving as your moderator. So on behalf of Aspen Institute Community Strategies Group and our partners, Ascend at the Aspen Institute and the National Center on Immigrant Integration at Migration Policy Institute, I wanna welcome you to today's webinar, Cultural Competency, Secrets to Success with Immigrant Families. Next slide. Today's webinar is the fourth and final webinar in a four-part series that uh, was designed to unpack the nuts and bolts and, and talk about all the creative strategies that nonprofit organizations are using to deliver two-gen services to immigrant children and families. Earlier this year, we surveyed the field um, and identified four areas where practitioners were uncovering promising practices to work with immigrants using a two-gen approach. And we developed this webinar series around those four practices. So we've held webinars on the topics of uh, building trust, working with immigrant families regardless of legal status, growing language skills with immigrant families, and if you miss any of those uh, webinars, you can watch the recording on the Aspen Institute uh, website. And I think my colleague is gonna put a link to those recordings in the chat box. But today we're gonna talk about cultural competency. And uh, during today's session, you're gonna hear from programs that have had promising models and good results. And our hope is that you're gonna get some ideas that you can actually replicate in your, your programs. So next slide. So we designed this uh, series, this four part series to include both webinars and deep dive peer advice and learning sessions. So after each webinar, we hold a peer advising and learning session on the topic area. And so on Thursday, December 2nd, we're gonna hold a peer advising and learning session about cultural competence. So if you're interested in you know, doing a deep dive on today's topic and, and discussing even more details about cultural competence, I encourage you to register for the peer advising session and to submit a question related to a challenge that you might be having around cultural competence. We're gonna pick two questions. And if your question is selected, you're gonna get some real-time practical advice from the speakers who are participating on this webinar today and from practitioners in the field. So uh, make sure that you, you submit a question, a sharp question, that's, that's just a question, uh, not, not just a description of your situation. And to get the best advice, um, if your question can be very specific, that's, that's really gonna help you get really sharp advice. So um, if you haven't participated in a peer advising and learning session, it really is, it's a fun uh, dynamic way to get uh, really helpful advice in a short period of time. So I'd encourage you, um, please do submit a question but the deadline is coming up quickly. So the deadline to submit a question is Tuesday, November 16th. And again, I think there was just a, a link in the chat uh, that you can access to, to register. Next slide. So to take, save time, I'm not going to do extensive um, introductions of our speakers, but I do encourage you to read their bios. Um, those bios and any resources that we mentioned today are going to be able to be located on the Aspen CSG website, and you'll also be able to watch um, the video of today's event uh, on that website. And everyone who was registered for today's webinar is going to receive a link to the recording and to the resources. Also keep in mind that uh, we want to encourage a broader dialogue about these issues with folks who may not be on this webinar. So we encourage you, please do share your insights and your thoughts about today's events via Twitter and LinkedIn by using the tags on this slide. Next slide. So we also want to be able to share insights with the folks that are on this webinar. So I want to just highlight two features. We've got the chat box um, so you can uh, share insights, um, support points that the speakers are making. Just be uh, mindful to do that with civility and compassion. 
we also have the Q&A box. Now, this is where you're going to post your questions for speakers. So um, you can use that Q&A box at any time. Um, we are going to have some time after the speaker presentations for questions, but um, they may be able to respond in live, uh, live time you know, to, to your questions on the, in the Q&A box. So please do uh, use that. Um, before we get started, I want to share just a bit of background about today's topic and about 2Gen. So first, a little bit about today's topic. Why are we focusing on cultural competence? Well, the first point is that when we did that survey that I mentioned, um, cultural competence really came up as one of the top strategies that programs are using to effectively serve immigrant families. So we thought it was important. And just a little bit of background is, you know, when you think about cultural competence, certainly understanding and speaking the language of families is at the foundation of cultural competence, but it's also about the individuals and systems responding in a respectful, effective manner to the people of all cultures, races, and ethnic backgrounds in a way that recognizes and values their worth. Um, cultural competence is really important today more than ever before because the cultural makeup of communities has changed. Over the last decade, immigrants and refugees from Central and South America, Africa, Eastern Europe, the former Soviet Union, they've come to the United States seeking refuge, asylum, and opportunity. And their arrival has brought increased cultural diversity and in some cases, cultural misunderstandings and confusion. But by understanding the cultures, and the populations that they serve, nonprofit organizations can avoid stereotypes and biases that can contribute to disparate treatment of different cultural and ethnic communities. And that's really central um, to, to, to the work that we're going to be talking about today. Um, understanding and respecting cultures should focus on the positive cultural characteristics and de de demonstrate an appreciation uh, of cultural differences. And as a result of, of understanding these cultures, you're gonna get better outcomes when working with immigrant, refu immigrant and refugee families. Okay, next slide. So I just wanna briefly touch on 2Gen because I, I mentioned that we're gonna be talking about serving immigrant families in a 2Gen way. So um, 2Gen is an approach that focuses on building family well-being by intentionally and simultaneously working both with the adults and the children together. And there are a lot of organizations that either start from the child side or from the adult side, but the goal really is to integrate elements that recognize the strength of the whole family. Okay, next slide. So this slide uh, is, is intended to uh, demonstrate the different cogs in the 2Gen machine. So you see you've got six different cogs, six different components of 2Gen. And I'll just briefly um, name them because you, you, you see it on the slide, but K-12. So all of the services that are needed for children in the K-12 through system, early care and education, and that's pretty broad. It's Head Start, Early Head Start, Family, family Friends and Neighbor Care, Child Care Partnerships, et cetera. Um, Post-secondary and employment pathways, again, you see education, training, workforce partnerships, uh, economic, ass economic assets, which helps families move up the economic ladder, uh, health and well-being, so, you know, resources that mitigate toxic stress, access to health services, health care coverage, and then social capital, which is really that connection, um, being in community with others, uh, having trusted connections. It's really what helps us all to thrive. So that's just a little bit of background about 2Gen, just so that we're all grounded. Um, now I'd like to talk uh, about who we've got lined up as speakers. Um, to the next slide. We've got a great lineup of speakers. And what I'm going to do is ask each of the speakers to just um, turn on their camera, unmute themselves, and just briefly introduce themselves by sharing their name, title, and organization. And we're going to start with Nancy, then we'll go to Danny and John. So Nancy, if you can uh, turn on your camera and unmute yourself. Hi, uh, thank you for this opportunity to connect with your audience. Uh, my name is Rawa Nancy Albilal, um, the president and CEO of the Arab American Family Support Center. It's nice to be here with all of you. Great, thanks, Nancy. And we'll move to Danny. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Danny Salim. I'm the senior director of the Solution Based Casework with the Arab American Family Support Center. And I'm excited to be here with you today and look forward to our. Uh, discussion. Great. And next, John. 
Good afternoon. My name is John Till, and I'm the Senior Vice President of uh, Strategy and Innovation at the Family Partnership, and uh, we're based in Minneapolis. Wonderful. Thank you, John. And I'm also pleased to introduce Margie McHugh. Margie is one of our partners for the, not just the event, but for, for this um, initiative. She's been really helpful in helping to design the event and helping with the brief. So Margie, can you uh, turn your camera on and introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Margie McHugh from Migration Policy Institute's National Center on Immigrant Integration Policy in Washington, DC. And just uh, great to be partnering with Aspen on this project and really looking forward to today's conversation. Great. Thanks, Margie. And Margie's going to rejoin in just at the end of the panel discussion to talk about policy. But first, I'd like to invite Nancy, Danny, and John to turn their cameras back on and join me for a conversation. Um, what I'd like to do, uh, Nancy, Danny, and John, is have a conversation about some of the promising practices that you've used around cultural competence. Um, so I think to get us started, though, it would be helpful for people to understand a little bit about your work. So um, what I'm going to ask is that each of you share just a little bit about your organization, the services that you provide, and then, and, and that's just in one or two minutes, if you could do that, but then spend a little bit more time telling us about the people that you serve. Um, which immigrants and refugee groups do you serve? You know, a little bit about them, how long they've been in the country, their strengths, their challenges, anything that will help us have some context for your work. So Nancy, maybe let's start with you. Talk, tell us a little bit about the Arab American Family Support Center. Sure, thank you. Uh, the Arab American Family Support Center is a nonprofit, non-sectarian organization uh, that was established in 1994 uh, to provide culturally and linguistically competent and trauma-informed uh, social services to low-income immigrants and refugees in New York City. Uh, while we support anyone who walks through our doors uh, over the last 27 years uh, or so, we have gained expertise serving Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian populations and North African populations. Uh, the populations we serve have faced discrimination and have been uh, the target of hateful rhetoric and they are separated from their families and some have to submit to DNA tests to uh, prove that they are related uh, in order to qualify for visas to unite with their family members here in the United States. Uh, the aim of our services is to help uh, these populations overcome a nexus of challenges, including uh, lingering trauma, discrimination, poverty, and the stressors of acclimating to a new world. Uh, our staff speak 32 different languages, including Arabic, Bengali, Urdu, Farsi, Spanish, and Hindi. Uh, enabling us to support communities that mainstream uh, providers struggle to reach. So uh, we are uh, an organization that's headquartered in Brooklyn, uh, New York. We are a settlement house uh, and we are geographically embedded uh, in the communities we serve with 12 locations across the five boroughs. Uh, we also offer online services, transcending geographic boundaries uh, and reducing access uh, to barriers to those that are not able to travel to our various locations. Uh, we are what you call a high tech organization and high touch organization and I'll leave it there. Great. Thank you, Nancy. And Nancy and Danny work together. So I'll just check in, Danny. Was there anything else you, you want to add or did Nancy cover it? Yeah, Nancy covered it all. I just want to add, like last year, we served the, uh, constituents from over 95 countries. So, and that speaks to the volume of the diverse population that we serve. And uh, so we've served at the bridge between the individuals and the, the system and tried to help them navigate the complicated system of New York City and the U.S. 
Great. Thank you both. You shared a, a, a great good picture for us of your organization and who you serve. So John, can you can you share a little bit of similar information about family partnership? Sure. So the family partnership is a multicultural service organization that was launched in 1878 as part of the child welfare movement across the United States. Today, our services fall into four main buckets. Uh, mental health services, both outpatient and school linked and in home mental health, home visiting uh, programming that's really designed to support uh, parents who are pregnant or parenting very young children. Uh, a, a third bucket of services is um, focused on helping uh, individuals who have experienced sex trafficking to get out of the life and to rebuild their life and move on. And then uh, a fourth really important bucket is our early childhood education program. We have a predominantly African-American preschool on the north side of Minneapolis. And we have um, a uh, Dakota and Ojibwe language immersion preschool right in the building that I'm in that is um, really the only uh, full language immersion uh, preschool working with indigenous kids and families in the state. So that's that's who we are. Um, and the community that I'm in where I'm speaking from right now is, is one of the neighborhoods that was most affected by the uprising after the murder of George Floyd. Uh, to the immediate west of us is Mercado Central on Lake Street in Minneapolis, which is the largest single hub of Latino businesses. This area is a Latino business district, but it's also a Somali business district. And, and just to our immediate east is an organization, really a, a building with a set of organizations in it that serve the Somali community, mostly non, mostly for-profit uh, home care services and overnight child care services. And uh, so we're in the heart of probably the most diverse uh, neighbor set of neighborhoods in Minneapolis and and the populations that we serve are where we do a lot of work with the Latino community here um, work you know work with the Somali community has varied over the decades uh, depending on what the community needed and what they're looking for in partnership right now that's um, mostly around crime prevention work right now uh, and uh, we're really here for all communities uh, that we that are in our community. So that's so that's a balancing act. Great. Well, thank you. That gives some good context about family partnership and the Arab American Family Support Center. So now I want to pivot a little bit and and talk a little bit more about um, this, the kinds of services that both of your organizations um, have provided. And I want to start with the pandemic. We know how the pandemic has um, impacted communities, and so. I'm very curious about how not only the pandemic has affected your community, but also how you've incorporated culturally competent approaches through that work. And, and John, I'm going to start with you because one of the things I, I found intriguing, and maybe this is a place to start, was that during the pandemic, you found that virtual services actually worked better for some immigrant families. So I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about that with the group and then any other anything else that you did differently during the pandemic. Sure. Well, probably a lot of our adaptations are extremely similar to everybody else in the country, which was a fast pivot to virtual services. And one of the things that we learned as we implemented that is that it was important to survey the families that we were working with to see what their needs were at this time. So for some families, that was a need for food, uh, particularly after the uprising in which it, a major grocery store burned down. For other families, that was access to digital technology. We offer mobility mentoring services as one of the kinds of services that our organization provides. That's uh, an evidence-based economic mobility coaching strategy. That work is led by uh, Maria Zavala, who um, is a veteran community organizer. That was her start here at the Family Partnership. And uh, what Maria and Andrea, who are leading that work, discovered in, in working with families is that for some of the immigrant families that we were doing weekly coaching with around economic mobility goals, 
they were really happy to provide those services virtually because it was less corralling of the family to get into a vehicle and go to a place and less stress about concerns being pulled over by the police, particularly for families that were, um, you know, had concerns that they were likely to be pulled over um, based on racial profiling uh, and police activity. So what, so we've really continued to offer that service on a hybrid basis. Families have engaged with it really well. And I think that's a that's that's kind of a major adaptation that we made. Um, we've really also beefed up the interpretation and language services that we're using to make sure we're reducing barriers as much as possible, whether it's an in-person interaction or one that's delivered virtually. That's another important thing. And I can talk a little bit about um, the strategies that we're using around culturally congruent mental health care um, later on, if that's of interest. Yeah, we're definitely going to come back to that, John. <laughs> um, so Nancy, uh, you and Danny used a similar strategy. I know you also launched a COVID-19 uh, impact survey. So I'm curious, maybe Nancy, if you could share kind of from a high level what you learned from the from this survey. And then Danny, if there's some examples of things that you did to respond to some of the needs identified in the survey, I'd love for you to share that. Sure. Um... Just like John, we really uh, learned so much about our community members, and we also learned about uh, our capacity as an organization. We looked at our strengths, uh, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and the services that we offer to our constituents. Uh, I would say uh, COVID uh, brought uh, uh, severe physical and economic and mental hardship uh, to immigrants and refugees, uh, understanding that a MEMSA population, Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian populations were rendered invisible in the mainstream uh, health data. Uh, so the Arab American Family Support Center had to launch uh, a COVID-19 impact survey, uh, which found that 74% of our respondents experienced a loss of income. 55% uh, of the respondents experienced barriers navigating uh, remote learning, and 45% of the respondents uh, reported mental health challenges. Uh, meanwhile, for families seeking uh, government assistance, uh, most encountered difficulties due to linguistic and technical uh, barriers and eligibility barriers. Um, on the uh, food and mental health the uh, side of the work that we found out is the food insecurity and mental challenge, uh, health challenges have risen dramatically uh, since the public health crisis, resulting in ongoing community needs of some assessment showing uh, that there is a tremendous need for mental health services. In fact, uh, we had a benchmark uh, assessing our mental health uh, service assessment in um, in February of 2020, 4% uh, of our constituents reported that they needed mental health services, whereas in January of 2021, 29% reported that they needed mental health services. So this really underscores the impact of um, uh, our destigmatizing uh, efforts related to uh, referrals uh, for mental health services, as well as uh, uh, the efforts that we have in uh, eliminating the stigma in accessing uh, mental health services. Right. Danny. Yeah, yeah. So, thank you, Nancy. What I would like also to add is that we have noticed an increase in uh, the need for helping families 
understand and navigate the new virtual system, especially when it comes to education. And so, you know, families are faced, originally we were helping the families advocating with their schools, but now what we're doing is really, and throughout the pandemic period, we try to help the families understand how to log in into the, uh, the classrooms, how to, how to monitor their students, how to help their students, how to be present. So that's, we noticed that increased need and we, we intensified our services and how, uh, allocated different resources from the skills of our case planners and staff to assist the families. Additionally to uh, what we noticed that originally before the pandemic, that families were not participating in support groups, especially uh, female participants, or when it comes to domestic violence, not feeling comfortable about coming and, and navigating the cultural limitations or that's imposed by the, uh, the spouse or by the, you know, often male member of the family. So post the pandemic that we were able to transcend that challenge because we were able to provide the, the family, the, the female um, uh, members of the families with access to online virtual learning. And so they were more comfortable and they were participating. We noticed an increase in the participation. Great. That was really, I think that th that conversation sets us up nicely for this, this next segment. Um, we tried to, I hope that this earlier conversation gave people a good understanding about your organization and the services that you provide. What I'd like to do now for the next 20 minutes is really dive into specific practices. So um, I suspect a lot of people that are on today's webinar, they want to hear your ideas and they're maybe thinking about how they can go back and, and replicate or, or you know, t t take advantage of some of the ideas that you're sharing. So I want to um, talk not just about what you did, like some of the things that you did to create cultural competence, but actually how you did it so that others will get ideas that they can replicate. So um, I'm gonna start with John, cause he kind of gave a, a, a hint of where he was going. He mentioned that uh, Family Partnership has been doing some work around culturally congruent therapy. So John, can you talk a little bit about culturally con congruent therapy, what that is? And then again, thinking about all the folks on the webinar, what are some of the steps that you take took to move in that direction? And what are some things that, uh, that our um, participants can consider? Sure. So culturally congruent care is language that's used in Minnesota for the idea that if I, if I come somewhere for a service, I'm interacting with someone who looks like me, who understands my culture, who speaks my language. And so the state of Minnesota uh, has funded an, an effort in, in several places around the state to develop capacity to provide services to immigrant communities, really BIPOC communities and LGBT communities. So black immigrant uh, and uh, people of color communities and LGBT communities with culturally congruent mental health care. Uh, the reason for that is because um, those groups have less access to uh, see therapists and clinicians who look like them and who understand their culture. And uh, clinicians of color who are, you know, graduate students getting ready to enter the field have lower rates of completing uh, licensure. And why is that? Well, it, it's mentoring and support. It's, it's being able to provide uh, mentoring that's culturally congruent and high quality clinical supervision to people who are entering the field. And so we've been, um, operating a program model that we call the diversity and social work advancement program for about 10 years now that is helping to um, increase the number of culturally congruent practitioners in the mental health field. It's a great program and we often end up hiring some of the graduate students who are, are part of that internship. But preceding that, there was a great deal of work uh, that our organization did to really get to know and understand our communities. Back in the 1970s, our services looked like, oh, you want mental health services? Well, you're probably white and you might be LGBT. You're probably female. You might be um, ending a relationship and coming to a new relationship. We weren't serving many children and you came to us. So in the 
early 90s, we had reached the conclusion, this is just not sufficient. And we added communities to our mission. And we mapped where our clients and program participants were coming from down to the block. And then we did door knocking and we asked people, what's your neighborhood like? What's your community like? What kinds of support does your family need? We also did input output economic analyses of neighborhoods and our communities that kind of showed where the resource drains were in communities. Like are people spending all their money outside their neighborhood? Um, that's important to know. And that, that work happened at the time when there was a lot of city redevelopment money going out to neighborhood organizations, not block clubs, but kind of larger city planning districts. And most of that money was being, the decisions were all being made by white homeowners. And so we developed grassroots leadership development programs for immigrant, uh, emerging immigrant leaders and communities of color so that they could have a voice in those decisions and neighborhood associations and really push for change. And uh, we developed a whole range of community programs. So by the mid nineties, we kind of had a sense of how our communities were changing, what some of the emerging immigrant communities were. And we really wanted to dive into more of how is family life changing across the state. So we did a statewide survey uh, called the Minnesota Family Strength Project. This is the research report. And when I'm not talking, I'll put links to it in the chat, as well as a link to a sub-study that uh, built out a model of Somali family strength, which was one of the emerging immigrant communities in Minnesota in the mid 90s and now very well established. And what we, what we did was, first of all, statewide phone survey, then Metro uh, in-person written surveys where we partnered with community organizations, particular organizations serving communities of color, immigrant communities, indigenous communities, and then finally a set of talking circles with African-American, Latino, Vietnamese, Somali, and American Indian families about what makes their family strong, what are the barriers to family strength, and um, what today we would call social determinants of health or health disparities or medical racism, access barriers. We had conversations about what were the barriers to family strength. And most of them fell into those categories, even though the language and social science hadn't quite emerged yet, and it, or at least it hadn't penetrated the human service field yet. And the most important thing that families across all these groups told us is, you know, it's great to be, it's great to be part of this study, but we've been studied to death and you need to do something with this. And so one of the first things that we did was hire positions called community builders that whose job was really to connect our service locations with the communities that they served. So they did a lot of door knocking. They did a lot of meetings with other community organizations, particularly immigrant organizations. And at the same time we were doing that, we, we were working on developing uh, what we called community counseling, which was community mental health strategies that would overcome some of the barriers that families of color and immigrant families spoke about um, in, terms of, in terms of barriers to family strength and barriers to access to care. And ultimately, things like our um, diversity and social work advancement program, which provides culturally congruent care, uh, that really came out of that work. But it involved a lot of trial and error. And, and uh, I, I, but if I look at where we're at today versus where we were when I started in 1998, we had no Spanish speaking staff in the organization and we weren't serving Latino families. And now Latino families are our primary customers for mental health services. So wow. there's been a huge transformation. So John, what I love in, in your remarks, you, you, you've outlined a number of different ideas that people can take advantage of. The surveys, the input output analysis, the talking circles, the community counseling approach. So what I would invite folks to do is if they want to hear more about any of these uh, particular strategies, you know, that's form it into a question that you can put in the Q and A box because we are going to have time for discussion. But I also want to um, hear a little bit from Nancy and Danny as well. So, so thank you, John, and 
I'm going to, um, I think there is a little bit of a theme between the work that you just described, John, and some of the work that Nancy and Danny have done. And um, Nancy and Danny, I, I particularly I think folks would be interested in some of your solution based casework, because that was another kind of strategy that you've you've used to help immigrant par parents navigate just everyday challenges. So I'm wondering if you can start there and then share any other uh, strategies that would be important for our audience to hear about. Definitely. Uh, should I start, Nancy? Please do. Yeah, so thank you so much. So the solution-based case work, through the solution-based case work, what we do is really we work with family building partnership and re while respecting the family's voice and choice. And through this partnership, we try to navigate, help them navigate everyday, their everyday struggles while focusing on some behavior change. It, while taking into account culture, cultural practices, beliefs, and values. So for example, we start by looking at the family genogram. So what do we mean by the family genogram? We'll look at the family, the actual nuclear family, and also the extended family members that are involved. As we know, we work with the Arab Muslim and South Asian community, and a lot of these communities live in a multi-generational household. So we have the in-laws, we have the aunts and uncles, and everyone is involved. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to assess who is involved with this family and create work with the family to create that support system. And then while also creating equal maps to assess the overall picture and who's connected with the family outside the uh, family dynamics. So who's connected from worship place, who's connected from the school, whether they have that good relationship with, with the school or the workshop place, uh, the worship place or the connection with any community resources outside that actual household. So additionally, what we do help the families now and get, understand some cultural limitations and also enhance some cultural practices that will help the family uh, succeed in navigating the complicated child welfare system in New York City. Because as we mentioned, a lot of our fam a lot of our families are newly migrated to, to New York City or the US. And with that comes some practices that might be acceptable, or not acceptable in New York City. So we help them to understand the do's and don'ts and don'ts throughout this system. And so and so that's additionally, we don't just focus on trauma informed. We are also we focus on resiliency informed. So what do we mean by resiliency informed is really what we have tried to adapt over the past uh, year or post pandemic or that we community resiliency models. So why are we helping families understand the, the zoning, the high zone versus the, the low zone and then bringing them back, equip them with some easy techniques to go back to the okay zone. And what do we mean by the okay zone is that the, the individual or the family that we're working with are able to navigate everyday situation by tapping onto their resiliency and tapping onto the skills that they could use to bring back, to come back to that specific moment and feel grounded. So we, we some of the techniques we use, like help now techniques, we ask them to like look at the room and count certain uh, colors that they could see in the room, or sometimes count backwards from 20 to zero, or sometimes just drink a, a glass of water. And so these are, there are many additional techniques that we've used through the community resiliency model. Nancy? Thank you, Danny. Uh, to, to us, uh, the way we uh, conduct our work is we recognize that these types of trainings would have to, in order for us to be effective, we have to conduct these trainings internally within the organization and externally. So the community resiliency model that uh, Danny was uh, speaking of focuses on the nervous system. So uh, you don't have to uh, know uh, the person's language uh, in order to emphasize what they're going through and how they're going through them. Uh, so we conduct these trainings on a regular basis within our 
own organization and with partner organizations. We recognize that constituents come to us not for one service, but for multiple services. The way we focus our work is that uh, where one program leaves off, another picks up. So our program are designed to be intertwined. At the heart of everything that we do is strengthening families, which is the ultimate goal of all of our uh, uh, programming. Uh, we also, part of the uh, initiatives that we have is that that ecosystem that uh, Danny was speaking of, quickly one can easily determine what work needs to be done by an organization is by focusing on the family at the heart of everything that you do and evaluating what institutions, uh, interactions, organizations that the families are seeking service, one can easily identify then what relationship do I have with uh, the organizations that are providing these services. If you don't have a formal collaboration with these institutions, one can identify that as a, a, a work that needs to be done because at any given moment, you need to be able to refer to another organization by reducing any barriers that your constituencies may encounter. Uh, so that's what the equal map will do. It determines what work you need to get done uh, as an organization. And if you could just, if you had to name kind of like one first step, if, if an organization wanted to create a map like that, what's kind of the first thing that they need to do? So one thing that you could do as an equal map, you put the, the family at the center mm -hmm. of that equal map. So family may interact with a faith-based organization, may interact with a school system, may interact with local businesses, may interact with law enforcement, and uh, you name it. There are a number of things that they may interact with on a daily basis. So as an organization, the best thing that you could do for your constituents mm -hmm. is for you to evaluate what relationship do you have within these institutions so that at any given time, if a family comes to you and says, my son is struggling or my daughter is struggling at school, uh, or we don't have access to a computer and yet we have to have these uh, online classes, you can, as an organization, advocate on behalf of your uh, constituents on behalf of the families with those institutions to make sure that you are able to reduce barriers for uh, your family members. If uh, young people in your program, uh, you want to make sure that they have a job uh, for the summer, you may uh, want to call up the local Trader Joe, which was which is what we do on a regular basis and say we have one of our young people would like to have a job and what we do internally as an organization uh, work with our uh, young people make sure that they have a resume make sure they have a LinkedIn uh, uh, prof uh, profile and how they could be successful in interviewing while you also have a relationship with the local business that is, you're going to be referring clients to so that they have ease of access to those institutions. It's very important as an organization for you to do your homework uh, to ease uh, the relationship that your constituents may have with local uh uh, nonprofit organization, or or uh, it could be the police department. Uh, the police department that we have in New York City uh, organizes our soccer league in which our uh, um, uh, youth can participate in a soccer league in competitions, and they get transportation by the police department, and they get to know our youth one on one basis, and they're familiar to our, uh, with our youth. You know, it, many of our constituents, they come from countries where the police 
is uh, not a source of security. It's a, uh, someone that you fear. Anybody that is in a uniform, you fear them. Uh, what we're trying to do is bridge that um, knowledge, that attitude, that behavior, so that the relationship between our youth and the police, our families and the police is more uh, functional and conducive to a good collaborative partnership. Yeah, that's so important at this at this current moment in time. Um, so I want to squeeze in two more quick questions if I can. So one um, to the to, to Nancy and Danny, and then one to both of you. So Nancy and Danny, maybe this is to Nancy, just like a one minute, since this is a webinar about two gen, I feel like I can't leave without asking you about your child and caregiver bonding circles. If you could just one minute explain what that is. And then if people want more information, we can maybe bring it come back to it in Q and A. Sure, our child uh, and caregiver bonding circle started out with uh, uh, 15 caregivers and now it is over 100 caregivers from almost every state of the United States participating in the child and caregiver bonding circle. Some of the uh, conversations that we have uh, with our constituents, they're really uh, difficult conversations, especially uh, for families or women uh, living in families that are two generation or multi generation in the extended family, from uh, child abuse and neglect to forced marriage to female genital mutilation to cutting to any number of conversations that we could have. Uh, Many of the conversations that we have also are one-on-one -on -one in that you establish a trusting relationship in which constituents can call up. Our staff members can uh, talk to them if there's an issue of uh, or challenge when it comes to incest or uh, some really difficult conversation like how to talk to your mother-in-law uh, who is yelling at the kids or how to talk to your husband or, or wife who uh, is the primary uh, breadwinner of the household and any extra income that's coming to the family, they wanna send it overseas and which creates uh, challenges and problems separate and apart from uh, all the other challenges that the families may have. All right, thank you for sharing that. I thought that was important to share with it with the audience. Um, so now I just want to just spend just a minute talking about partnerships because I know that partnerships are so important to this work. So I'm going to go to John first, and then Nancy and Danny. Just a minute, like if you could just share um, any advice about partnerships, or if there were any partners that were critical to to bring to the table for your work, please share that with the audience. So John, we'll start with you. Sure. So partnerships are really important, and um, just to give you a couple of examples, I saw a question about, well, what if you're a small organization and you don't have many staff? Well, it depends a lot on where you are because if you're located in a suburban community, for example, all space for gathering may be highly commodified. Every school has plenty of space, but they may charge a great deal to, to access that space. So if you have immigrant families, for instance, who wanna gather to teach their children their culture, practice literacy or social skills, you may find that your facility could open its doors and create a really good partnership with an immigrant organization. A lot of our early work was really around getting to know who was the leadership in immigrant communities, who was starting their own nonprofits, uh, and uh, how, could, how could we help them? How could we build partnerships around mental health services? Because those are often areas where someone may be able to start an organization and provide navigator or bridge builder services for a lot of things, but mental health is a specialized field. Uh, so even a small organization can think about where they are and who is around them and how to build those relationships. Um, to maybe say something about another kind of relationship or partnership, uh, we published one of the first, probably the first domestic violence prevention message poster in the Somali language, probably on the planet. And we worked with Somali domestic violence advocates 
around the development of the language. We worked with a variety of skilled interpreters from the community around the language messaging. And that's something to keep in mind too. It's, it's probably obvious to people who've been working in the field for a while, but one person may say, ooh, that's like really gangster language. You know, street kids will understand that, but parents are gonna run in the other direction if they see that message. So that's kind of one level. And then the other level was the images. We, we were really iterative about the image of a Somali couple. And, and like the image of, of uh, the mother with child that was early in the PowerPoint where they're kind of squatting down on the floor, it was, it was a man and a woman and they were kind of low on the ground. The woman was working on a weaving project. That's kind of what the Somali uh, uh, advocates said the image should show and everybody was happy with it and there were men at the table and then we actually printed the posters and the feedback from other men in the Somali community was hey this guy's just squatting there he's not doing anything what what's up with this like we don't like the image of men doing nothing um and and so the the work around partnership is never really done right you may find that the message isn't quite complete or that it doesn't work for everyone. And it's really uh, the people in the community who will tell you that. And oftentimes when what we found over the years doing family-centered community organizing with immigrant communities was that uh, there's schools, the schools that these families were um, having their kids go to had said, you know, we've tried everything around parent engagement and nothing works. And the one thing that the school staff had not done was ask families what they wanted, why they would like to come together, what did they want to know when they were um, invited to a gathering at the school. So, so asking what people want is, is at the heart of partnership, getting to know people and asking what they want. Okay, so John, I think we're gonna uh, like make that the last word on partnership because I wanna quickly uh, hear from Nancy and Danny and then we're gonna move to a little bit of a policy discussion. So Nancy and Danny, any, anything quick that you would say about partnership? Partner well with others. Uh, you never know when it's gonna be time for you to send a referral to uh, another organization. Uh, I would say uh, be generous with the information that you have as a learning organization we learned uh, and it was it embedded into the culture of the organization is to document promising practices and lessons that are learned and uh don't be uh, shy or embarrassed about uh if uh, something is not working uh, let that be a teachable moment uh, where you could spotlight uh, what's working, what's not working, what needs to improve and what changes. Uh, involve the community in your uh, uh, strategies. Uh, voice and choice are absolutely essential. Uh, so there has to be a, a culture of humility in the way you approach your strategic planning. And uh, we had to do a lot of uh, research, primary research best uh, and document best practices and share it with others. And that's why you see a lot of our uh, Arab American Family Support Center Research Institute uh, information is online so that others can uh, learn from our experience and evaluate what's working, what's not working, what needs to change. Uh, we recognize that also the voices and choices and the experience of our constituents is not included in mainstream data and mainstream uh, research. For example, if you wanna look up what do uh, Arab, Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim and South Asian populations need or want, you cannot go to the census information and look up that information uh, because Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim and South Asian are merged into the white population when it comes to demographics. 
That's an excellent point, Nancy. And hopefully we, we whetted uh, everyone's appetite to maybe dig in deeper about partnerships and we can come back to that at the Q&A. But um, at this point, I wanna pivot because with each of these webinars, we do have a little bit of a conversation about policy and we have a policy expert um, on our panel today. So at this point, I'd like to invite Margie McHugh to turn on her camera. I'd like to bring her into this conversation and I have a couple questions. Um, that I'd like to get Mar Margie's input on. So Margie, if you could join. Wonderful. Great. So Margie, I am just curious um, at the beginning when I started talking about cultural competence, I mentioned that understanding and speaking the language um, is one of the foundations of cultural competence, um, but often linguistic competence and cultural competence, they're referred to separately. And so I'm curious from your perspective, how do you understand the programs or system frameworks that are in use that treat these distinct, but closely related elements of service competence? How should we be thinking about this? Uh, I've been thinking about it the entire time during the webinar here because it's um, from a policy perspective, it, it's really uh, frustrating to, um, to think that in a sense, I think in a lot of policy uh, and funding streams, the federal government thinks because it has said that language access is governed by a particular set of legal rules, you know, that if you're, if you're receiving uh, social services, health, other funding that has a federal, uh, federal funding element to it, that you're just supposed to be not letting language barriers be uh, language barriers prevent access for any folks who are limited English proficient from accessing your services. So I think the policy construct or the policy thinking to the extent that it's really thought about um, in a, at the federal level, it's this idea that, well, we said you should be doing this. And you know, then your state and local entities that give you our money say, oh yeah, we know we're supposed to be doing this but that there's really not much, uh, not much uh, true attention uh, being paid uh, to those barriers or to uh, do the capacity building around it. And so charitably, I guess I would say that, you know, there's the sense that we have a legal framework around language access and then cultural, uh, culturally responsive services, cultural competence is so often added in with that kind of, I think, recognizing that language, language access, language competence um, is, the, is a foundation. I mean, how can your service be effective if people can't uh, understand, you can't understand them, they can't understand you. And then culture, culture is, you know, as I understand it, sort of layered in on top of that and much less uh, well-defined. And so I really would love to hear um, uh, John, Nancy and Danny, um, um, talk a little bit more about what it's, you know, I'd imagine that they've been trying to educate a lot of their funders about the ways in which they're not really rewarded for the work that they're doing. They've done so much important work uh, to really figure out how to bridge with culturally diverse communities and provide effective services. And really the idea that so much service provision is not effective because it doesn't have these elements um, is, is not something that I think we're really uh, trying to figure out how to design funding streams, funding competitions, which is what it comes down to very often, uh, in a way that rewards the sort of work that they're doing. So I, I, um, anyway, I think that's a, a really big policy implementation question, I would say. All right. Um... I'm gonna, I wanna ask you one, I know you you, you offered to uh, get John and, and Nancy to weigh in and I'm gonna come back to it because I wanna ask you one more question, Margie, and then we'll open it up uh, to hear from our panel and to accept uh, Q and A from the audience. Um, but my second question that I had, Margie, is about um, this webinar has really focused on frontline services and what they need to do to be culturally sensitive and uh, competent. And I'm just curious, are there things that policymakers need to attempt to do to ensure that services are culturally competent or are there, are there ways that they can do things better? Sure. I mean, that's a um, that's a, a huge piece of the work that 
um, our organization focuses on in our, in our research and capacity building and the like. Um, I'm really hopeful that the current discourse we're in related to uh, racial equity and uh, figuring out how to do a much better job of understanding what the um, gaps and challenges are and how we're uh, how we've designed a lot of our service systems is actually going to result in us uh, really making some major changes because so many of the major funding uh, streams and programs are built on research that uh, I think Nancy is the one who said this, that uh, the research just hasn't included many of the key populations that, um, that are um, in, in communities today. And so they're, they're actually, the data issue that Nancy raised, which is a critical one, notwithstanding, we actually do have a lot of data, um, very easily accessible um, through census data that, uh, that really could be plugged in to how, how we're, a lot of our policy frameworks. Just thinking about what's about to happen with childcare and you know, some, some amount of money will be coming down under Build Back Better. Well, if we think about, if we look at issues like poverty, uh, uh, linguistic isolation, uh, parents' levels of formal education, um, limited English proficiency, et cetera, et cetera. They're all there in everyone's data. And yet we're not really thinking that, well, most, most of the, uh, many of the families we wanna reach are actually in the family, friend and neighbor part of the, of the, uh, of the field, not in formal childcare. What are we going to do about that? Why, if we're gonna use an equity lens, if we're gonna really follow data, in terms of um, uh, what sort of services should be provided, that alone, numbers alone should drive us to these families. Well then what's effective practice with these families? It's linguistic responsiveness, cultural knowledge and responsiveness. And I think we just have to accept that we really got, um, we've committed to a lot of ways of doing things that really, uh, aren't taking account of major, por major uh, portions of populations that we mean to serve. And I, I think it's the same case with home visiting um, and that a lot of this, uh, I think we have the tools to try and uh, from a policy point of view, be adapting how we're, uh, how we're putting out funding, how we're thinking about service designs and responsiveness, but we just really haven't taken the next step to do a lot of the uh, the changes in, uh, in plugging that into, uh, don't just tell us, yes, of course, we have, we have folks who speak languages other than English. Do they match the population that's there in the community? Are you giving most of your points for a track record in providing service as opposed to your ability to actually serve the people who are now in your community who are intended to be served under these, uh, under these designs? So I, I think that there's, um, that you know, we're, we're on the edge of some real opportunities. And I, I just hope everyone has the confidence to really say how much needs to change in order for us to uh, really uh, redesign uh, a lot of how we've gone about uh, uh, work in, I, I thought your slide about all the things that are encompassed under 2Gen um, at the beginning of the webinar, Karen, it's sort of, you know, every, everything that has been put in place to try and um, uh, in the anti-poverty field over 50 or 60 years, you know, but I think especially now, um, at least, uh, you know, for now, it seems a lot of the opportunities are in the early childhood uh, and K-12 spaces. And that, um, you know, that I, I just think we're, uh, we're about to make some really big investments and we are making them, especially in the early childhood field, but not being honest about what quality and effectiveness really looks like. And so, um, I just think uh, I'm excited to see so many people interested um, in this webinar and the webinar series. And I hope everyone sees themselves as a policy actor, not just a practice actor, because this is really a moment um, for really uh, trying to pull fields forward uh, to what's really the reality in local communities. So as always, Margie, you, you always give us some food for thought <laughs> regarding policy. So appreciate your, 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 um, your, your remarks. Um, at this point, uh, I am going to offer John and Nancy literally like one minute if you want to add to anything that Margie just said from a policy perspective, and then we're going to go straight to questions. So, John, I'll go to you first. Any any remarks or reactions to um, Margie's comments? 
Sure. I mean, it seems like the, the current way that language is dealt with in grant proposals is that it is an additional cost, which the provider needs to eat out of the fixed budget, right? So that's kind of a structural problem for anyone who is providing these services. Um, one solution is hire people who speak the language, but then there's the question of compensation and people wanting co you know, better compensation because they have the linguistic competencies that you need. So that's, that's kind of one piece. Maybe I'll, I'll call back to when I started my career. It was in a migrant farm worker service organization and my boss, Betty Garcia Mathewson, hired me to do HIV work in women's prisons. And one of the things that she said, and she, she was raised as a Latina young person in the Midwest and in a community where Latinos were told not to speak their language, not to speak their native language. Um, one of the things that she told me early on was people heal in their own language. So that, that, that has to be a, a principle that we bring to this work is the awareness that people heal in their own language. And what triggered that thought for me uh, Margie was when you were talking about home visiting because I was just in a conversation with um, a home visiting supervisor yesterday who was talking about using interpreter services to kind of expand who we could serve through home visiting and I, I was questioning myself well is that going to work you know an interpreter is a third person in the household you're you're doing parenting education and support in a really intimate environment, how, how would that work? So, I mean, I think there, there's really a lot of challenges around how we build capacity and who, how we recognize who does have the skill. Right. Um, right. Thanks, John. Nancy, do you want to weigh in? Sure. I think it's the responsibility of every organization to educate uh, partners to educate policymakers to educate the public uh, and you're kind of caught in a bind you're educating internally within the organization you're also educating externally to your constituents and you are uh, educating those that are in a policy decision making uh, situation uh, with the just to bring you one example the toughest thing to change is culture and uh, the power dynamics within the family and outside of the, the family among policymakers as well. Uh, the chi child tax credit, for example, it's supposed to be a good thing uh, for community members. This gives them a, a lifeline uh, in, in a a situation where they need it the most, especially during a pandemic. But the power dynamics, for example, if you have conflict between a husband and wife and you have a restraining order in which the uh, husband is the uh, uh, one that controls the finances for the organization, those tax credits are deposited in the account that is controlled by the men. And uh, it's supposed to benefit the children. These children are not benefiting as a result of uh, the child tax credit. And therefore, a, a, a survivor of domestic violence has to turn to organizations like, for example, the Arab American Family Support Center, where we're providing help or assistance in uh, their uh, times of need. In a regular year, we spend about twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars on emergency assistance. In a pandemic year, so far we've spent five hundred thousand hmm. dollars. In a situation like this, we have to, as an organization, diversify our income stream because funding from government does not allow for creativity, does not allow for nimbleness, does not allow for us to address the emerging needs that are happening on a daily basis. So uh, in some circumstances, you have to go back to your funding source uh, whether it's private funders or public funders and educate them on what is happening on the ground and what it means 
for you to renegotiate the goals and objectives of your contract with them or your grant with them so that they could be redesignated uh, to emerging needs and uh, the programs that you are uh, putting together to address the emerging needs of your constituents. Yeah, I know that's something that a lot of the participants on this webinar can relate to, Nancy. So good, good advice on that point. Um, I want to respect, we've actually got lots of questions in the, in the Q&A box. So I do want to make sure that we uh, have some time to address some of the questions from participants. So I'm going to bucket um, a couple questions. Um, in the Q&A box um, about mental health services for Latinos. So I just wanna pose a, a couple. So one question asks, are mental health services for Latinos de designed in a culturally specific way? And then there is a similar question about um, learning more about the strategies to provide mental health services to Latinos, um, particularly because as the question says, we know Latinos are the ethnic group that are uh, resistant to reach out to, for mental health services. So any information you can share about that? Those are two questions I'll pose for the panelists. I can try to take that one. Um, I think we've, we've found uh, Latino families to be the immigrant group that is most responsive and interested in mental health services. And I think that goes back to something that we learned in the Minnesota Family Strength Project, which is that people were willing to seek out uh, mental health services if a family member, if a loved one was suffering, they're far more willing to do that and they'll do it a lot more quickly than they will do it if they are the one suffering. And that's actually what we see. We see parents bringing in kids. And so we can do family therapy. We can do individual kid therapy. We can do play therapy, et cetera. We can use methods that are appropriate for the individual or family that we're, we're providing service to. But um, in our community, at least, we've, we've found Latino families to be extremely interested in and receptive to, um, to the to the, you know, the idea of mental health services and counseling. And why is that? Well, I don't know. I mean, it was, I would guess it has something to do with media that Latino families consume and what they're hearing on um, trusted media sources, whether that's radio or, um, or other, other sources. So, so with respect to that, um, that, that's an answer to that question. And the, the second question, I think, related to what What's, you know, are we using culturally specific mental health treatment approaches? Uh, that's, that's really challenging. What, we're, what we are trying to use as much as possible is evidence-based practices that are known to be effective with cultural groups that we're trying to serve. So that, that's, that's our approach. Uh, and we're working with a lot of families that have trauma experiences. So those would be the, probably the same kinds of evidence-based practices that are trauma-informed that other people are aware of. Also, I would like to add that what we do at the Arab American Family Support Center is navigate the, the word uh, mental health and the stigma around mental health. And so that's education, raising awareness among the community. Because for example, I could speak about the, for example, the Arabic, the Arab community and the use of mental health, the translation into Arabic, it means crazy. So when we're talking to a, a family, hey, we need to refer or work with your son or daughter, refer them to mental health therapy, uh, uh, counseling, or when we get referrals, for example, from ACS, Children Administration Services, for survivor of domestic violence to be evaluated for mental health. So that requires a lot of work to first educate ACS about the terms and the recommendations, and also educate the families what mental health means in the US and the need how to navigate this challenge and how to work around the stigma. So awareness is key. Great, there is another, oh, go ahead, Nancy. Karen, if, if I may add here also, it's very important for you to work with the faith-based community. Uh, in many situations, uh, constituents turn to 
uh, the faith-based community for help and assistance. Praying together, that's great and wonderful, terrific. It may ease your burden, but sometimes we, what we need to also do is work with the faith-based community to educate them about some of the solutions and referring to uh, organizations like ours to uh, get help and assistance for the families. Praying is wonderful, but it may not be enough. Okay, um, I have, so you know here, Miriam has a comment that she wants to share regarding mental health and cultural groups and needed policy. So Miriam, I'm gonna ask you if you can uh, take yourself off mute. You can, you can share that. Are we able to do that? Oh, um, Tyler, can you, Miriam is not unable to unmute herself. Can you help? So, Hello. Can you oh, okay, me? perfect. Yes, we can hear you, Miriam. Thank you very much, Karen, first of all, for bringing such a wonderful panel. You know, it's so great to hear all your perspectives, but I know we are short of time and I would love to continue this conversation with John. Mental health is, you know, I, I'm not going to repeat what everybody has said, not only <clears throat> mental health, but neurodevelopmental conditions as well in cultural communities seems like it's posing a lot of problems, particularly me right now. I'm going through that issue with my young adult son of 24 years age. What's out there is an, a cohort of you know, people of color that are suffering of mental health or neurodevelopmental conditions that have not been identified or diagnosed. And for that, you know, they fell through the cracks and they end up in the criminal justice department. So, you know, I was just, it's amazing. I was just this guy, I work at the Department of Human Services, Disability Services Division here in Minnesota. And I was just brainstorming with my supervisor how we can come up and partner with stakeholders that are already dealing with such situations and bring this issue, you know, to uh, to light. You know, people that are not diagnosed, and we all know that there are, you know, uh, systemic barriers for them to be. How would I say, forced to get services? We know that as an adult unless you accept and unless you are in compliant, you cannot get help and your family cannot trust you. Yes. I, I see that John is nodding his head. So I wanna- <laughs> John, I wanna continue with John. I would love to continue with John. Yeah, what I'd love to do, John, if you wanna weigh in with a comment and then I, we do have a couple other questions I wanna see if I can squeeze in. So Miriam, thanks for that. And John, let's see if you have uh, some, some, some remarks to share with Miriam. Miriam, thank you. For full support for what you're saying. Love to talk with you further and, and connect to you with some of our staff who are actually working with youth who have, they're, they're using mental health strategies that are uh, with youth who have uh, justice system involvement or at a high risk for it. Love to talk with you more about that. And I'll, I'll put my email address in chat. So I have one- Thank you, John. I have one related question, and then I'm going to pivot to a different direction after this. But um, there's a question about barriers to accessing mental health. So um, there was a person that said, John, you had mentioned community surveys where you identified barriers. But Nancy and, and Danny, I'm sure you have some ideas about some of the barriers as well. Could you talk a little bit about some of the barriers that you've identified in accessing mental health care? Well, uh, the so this goes back a while. Um, in our in our in the Minnesota Family Strength Project, what we identify we we actually asked who do you turn to when you have a family problem or an emotional problem, and it was absolutely faith leaders were very important for people. Um, also, um, some people talked about going to a counselor. 
some people talked about going to an, an astrologer or a fortune teller. And I wouldn't necessarily dismiss that as a silly idea for many of our immigrant communities uh, and others. Such people are, are people who help. Um, so what it provoked for us was thinking about, well, if we're offering mental health in an office in a very cold clinical setting, that's probably not gonna be attractive to a lot of the people that we're trying to reach. So we're always thinking about how, we're always thinking about warmth. How do we create a warm environment where people feel welcomed and trusted? COVID has made that so hard, right? For so many different reasons and it's increased people's sense of isolation a great deal as well. And um, I, I, I know there are a lot of que other questions out there. So maybe I'll leave it at that is that thinking about who do people turn to for help is so important. And, and uh, Rawa was talking about that a little bit too. And then how do you build bridges with those people that help you connect with people who do need the help? Nancy, Danny, anything you would add to that? Healing circles are very important uh, to restorative justice or transformative type of uh, justice. Um, healing circles bring together uh, individuals with common an interest, a common uh, plight. And so it's one way of uh, approaching the issue of uh, mental health. And it's very important to start very early to talk about uh, mental health uh, with our youth. Uh, they are very powerful educators for their family members. And so what we've done over the years is uh, work with our youth to take the information that we're providing them, have that dialogue, that conversation in which they could take that information to their peers, as well as to their own family members. Danny, you wanna talk about some of the healing circles that we have? Yeah, definitely, Nancy. So I um, just want to, in addition to the hidden circle, so what we do, uh, I would like to add that uh, working around the terminal terminologies of mental health, because as I mentioned, you know, in the U.S., we could be using a, some of the terms could be very complicated for the, for the families we, we serve. So working around these terminologies, making it simple, using the translation in the first language and also not just translation, have, we're talking about language. So making sure that we're using terms that are acceptable by the community. So that's one part. Going back to the uh, uh, post COVID, what we noticed that because we were able to address the cultural limitations, for example, in domestic violence situations where still the abuser or the person that caused harm is living with the, uh, the survivor, uh, sometimes there's limitation that wouldn't allow them to go outside of the home or there's control. So through the virtual work, we were able to reach, to, to reach out to them and we're able to provide the services in their home. So they don't have to make that trip. They don't have to worry about being controlled. They don't have to be worried about being followed. So we had to use certain coding words to connect with the survivor and then able, we were able to provide this kind of services. Going back to the healing circles, what we do is really help uh, uh, from their homes, we're able to provide that connection with people who might have similar stories and share, build that connection, build that community throughout the, why, taking, why making sure that that space, the virtual is resiliency and trauma effect. Great, thank you. We are quickly approaching the end of this webinar, and I don't want us to log off before kind of hearing from each of our four panelists your top piece of advice. You've got these participants on the webinar that want to hear uh, what you would suggest for building cultural competence. So uh, who wants to go first? I'm going to pick on Nancy. 
Sure. I would say at the heart of uh, the issue is practicing cultural humility and allowing the families that you interact with to guide you through the process. Uh, sometimes it's very important, let's say it's very difficult to hire somebody with uh, the multiple language sk skills that are needed by uh, your constituents. Hire someone with the passion for your mission and uh, with the empathy for your constituents. At any time, any day, I will take passion uh, over someone that speaks a language because somebody that may speak the language may not have the values or may not have the empathy for the constituents that you are serving. Passion, empathy are absolutely critical. Listen and learn from your constituents. Uh, they will guide you. Excellent advice, Nancy. Okay, Margie is next on my screen. So Margie, we'll come to you next. Um, I would say insist on math um, with all of the policymakers that you deal with. I just think that, you know, we, we should be so beyond uh, trying to uh, share promising practices. They should be rewarded. They should be exactly what we are aligning funding streams with and service designs with. And uh, I just feel that um, I've been in the field for um, many, many years, laughing a little bit um, at Danny referring to ACS, catching the New York acronyms there. Um, but um, but that, you know, these are issues that have been around for 30 years now, at least just with regard to a serious, you know, a more serious conversation about immigrant and refugee communities. And it keeps getting put, it, it, it just keeps being avoided as if we have the research base and as if, um, you know, as if somehow all, all these programs are gonna figure it out and manage to survive where they're competing in funding streams, where they're not getting any of the additional funds that are required to, um, uh, be doing the effective services that they're doing, and uh, never mind that there's really a, a still very disproportionate access to services for communities that are really meant to be served. So um, I think it's time to insist that there is math to make sure that uh, services are being more equitably provided. Uh, and that uh, and that the issues we're talking about today and linguistic and cultural responsiveness more broadly um, are what it takes to do that is being recognized and baked in to um, to service designs. I love it. That's a strong call to action, Margie. <laughs> okay, Danny, we're going to go to Danny next and give John the last word. Uh, thank you. So first, being mindful of my own biases, of my own uh, assumptions, and also remember that we are working with individuals and try to understand that individual worldviews and their own personal sense of their cultural identity. All right, John, you've got the final piece of advice. Don't make assumptions. Looking at me, you would not know that I live in a Filipino American immigrant household. Awesome. <laughs> I think that's the perfect way to end our webinar for very solid pieces of advice. Uh, I want to make sure we end on time. So I'm going to conclude with just three short remarks. Um, one, I want to thank you all for attending. Um, I hope you've gotten some good ideas um, from today's session. Secondly, don't forget to re register for the peer advising and learning session. I saw that there was a link. Devin just put a link in the chat. So please do register. And then finally, um, I want to let you know that you're going to receive an evaluation um, from today's session. So please do complete it. It gives us valuable information to help shape uh, future programming. So thank you very much.